virtual tour for quite, a, for quite a while now. We have been operating for over a year. Uh, tonight, uh, we have a couple of more members of our committee. We have Simi from Ottawa, Canada, and we have Alonso from Brazil. Uh, there is the at the time, seven we have had some people rotating in and out of our committee that plans some of these activities. And, but uh, at any point, anyone who wants to join us um, is welcome to contact us. And uh, we're always looking for new ideas for speakers and uh, to bring you connections. And uh, no. No. while we are still not able to travel or if we're traveling, making new friends via Zoom. Um, so um, our, our hope is to continue having these uh, talks, to continue to share our cultures uh, from wherever we are. And uh, we may be trying something new in the, in the near future, uh, which is the, just having a social hour instead of one of these presentations. And we'll see how that goes okay. at the suggestion of yes. some people to just spend time connecting with each other in little groups. That's like good. if you're visiting at home or something. So mm -hmm. we're going to try that. So you will be hearing about it. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll be sending a little article to Sheila to put in the Me connections too. letter and then uh, of our plans for the future. So at this time, I pass the baton to the... Uh, okay, a couple of rules. I'm sorry. A couple mm -hmm. of little rules. Uh, please uh, mute yourself while yeah, the speaker is making the presentation. Uh, there will be, uh, after the presentation, the opportunity for questions and answers. And then we will break into a couple of uh, small groups. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, Alonso uh, will be collecting questions also. Please type them in the uh, chat room on uppercase letters if you can to make Alonso easier for him to read what the question is. So with that, uh, I turn over to Simi. Thank you, Lihia, and thank you, <laughs> Sheila. So Sheila Hart is our presenter today. She'll be giving us a pre presentation on her district uh, 5080. Sheila Hart joined Rotary in 1993 as charter member of the Rotary Club of Nelson Daybreak in Nelson, British Columbia, Canada. At the time, she was involved with a career in healthcare administration. She has a deep passion for Rotary and has served as club president and club public relations chair. Her involvement with Rotary District 5080 has been extensive, including serving as Rotary Friendship Exchange Chair for many years, a faculty member of Pacific uh, Northwest President's Elects yeah. Training Pets, mm -hmm. Rotary Leadership um, Institute Instructor, Assistant Governor, and most recently as the District Service Committee Chair. Rotary has taken Sheila around the world as a group study exchange team leader to Bangalore, India, as a Rotoplast team a member to Peru and Nepal, and as a Rotary Friendship Exchange team member to Brazil, England, Sweden, New Zealand, Australia, and the United States. For many years, she served IDHF as uh, the VP for Western Canada, and then served as president from 2017 to 2019. Sheila and her husband, Bill, love to travel and have touched down in over 100 countries. Wow. They can hardly wait until November to go on the IDHF tour of Brazil and hopefully, while en route, visit families scattered around Canada and meet two great grandchildren. You have traveled a lot, Sheila. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so <Touch it's> down. <laughs> I've been really lucky. I'm, I'm actually looking at, at Patty and the first um, Rotary Friendship Exchange we ever did was with District 5080 and District 5100 in Portland. I was enchanted. The rest is history. <laughs> okay, I'm going to um, hope this works. I'll share my screen. Oh, somebody's got my, you've disabled my screen sharing. Uh oh. Mia uh -oh. Mia uh -oh. Uh, <laughs> uh oh. Let me make you the co-host. There you go. 
Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, I'm learning. <laughs> Come on. Here we go. Okay, from the beginning. And I'm going to start this actually by with a territorial acknowledgement. Um, as you know, Canada has a really unhealthy uh, situation with our Indigenous people. Of course, it was long before I was born. So anyway, I would like to acknowledge that, that I am on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Sinex people. I feel privileged and grateful to be here and honor the ongoing presence of the Sinites on this land. We are mindful of how we carry ourselves today so as to demonstrate our intentions to honor this land, water, and all beings. So I'll start my show by with this diagram of District 5080, and it includes southeastern British Columbia, very mountainous area of British Columbia, northern Idaho panhandle, and eastern Washington state. So we're an international um, district, and uh, there are differences. Okay, I named this Finding Awesome because I am still in awe, although I've spent the last 50 years in this area. Uh, it really, truly is awesome. And you're seeing here the wonderful uh, flora on the mountain, in the mountain uh, valleys and reaches. Usually they bloom in late July, early August, and it is just outstanding. So we're starting our tour in southeastern British Columbia. I've mentioned the indigenous people here, and here are some of the early writings that have been on a rock face for millennia. And they usually um, were calling on spirits when they, when they did these drawings. We live in an area where there's many wild animals. They wander through our yard all the time. I've only once seen the animal on the left, which is a mountain caribou. And they are actually quite um, under stress right now, put it that way. The mountain or the sheep on the right are rather interesting. They spend the summers up high in the mountains, but I love it if we happen to be going on a highway over a couple of mountain passes in the winter because they love to come down to the lower elevations where they get to lick the salt on the side of the road. The wolves have been here for forever. They've actually found um, bones um, that are 10,000 years old. Just incredible. Mountain goats, you'll see these animals on the narrowest little pathways going up the mountain and you think, how do they never fall off? And deer. Now the, these I'm I have a love-hate relationship with because I keep eating my tulips and everything. So I have to get out there and spray to keep them away. But they're in our yard all the time. And this is a baby deer. And so often people think a deer like this is injured. It's not. The mother away is away uh, grazing. And if you ever happen to be in this area and you see a little baby deer like this, do not think he needs to be rescued. If actually, if you touch it, the mom will not come back to the deer, but otherwise she will come and nurse the deer. Bears, we have a love-hate relationship with bears. Uh, the grizzly bear actually is carnivorous um, and they tend to live up higher in the mountains. Uh, but I'm gonna tell you what, I was asked to talk about our favorite food here. And I'm going to say that one of our favorite foods is the huckleberry, which is a form of wild blueberry. And we enjoy it as much as the bears do. And in fact, the bears get fat uh, eating huckleberries, usually in late September when they're really plump. Um, so that goes along really well with standing beef rib roasts, asparagus from Creston, and I love to make huckleberry pies. You'll hear about huckleberries again. Here you have Denver Glacier. Actually, it is receding rather quickly, but we'd love to talk about 
circle tours here. And the Silvery Slocan Circle Tour is one of the um, most favorite routes for the motorcyclists. Um, you're, you're out in the rural areas, just two lane highways, and they have great fun uh, speeding along. Um, the, the, silver, the Silvery Slocan name uh, came from the fact that there were many silver mines discovered in this area, especially just before the turn of the century. Uh, in Silverton, actually, it had the largest producing silver mine in, I think, in the world at one stage. I'm going to put in a little plug. I don't know how many of you like to cycle, but I have to do a bit of promo for one of the uh, cycling tours that's going to happen here in September. It's called the Wakanide Ride, Washington, Canada, Idaho. And it's sponsored by the Rotary Clubs around the, um, the circuit. And I know they've got about 99 people registered for this already for this year because, of course, it, had, it didn't operate for a couple of years. But this is the type of scenery that the cyclists see. And they actually uh, stay two days in my hometown of Nelson. And so we have a great time showing them about. They have to go across the lake on the ferry. This is our Osprey 2000. It's the longest free ferry ride in North America. And you have all this beautiful mountain scenery. And who's it named after? Ospreys. These, are, these birds love to fish and they will build nests on tops of old stumps up high or um, if, especially if there's any pylons around a ferry landing, they just love to have their nests there. Another view of beautiful Kootenai Lake, where I have the privilege of living and swimming and boating on. We also have a tour uh, of natural hot springs. And this Ainsworth is about, mm, about a 40 minute drive from where I live. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been known for a millennia. The, the indigenous people here used to love it where they go and soak in the springs after they'd been out hunting or uh, gathering or whatever. So, and this, actually this um, hot spring is really interesting because it has caves. They put lights in the caves so you can wander back through the caves and uh, sit on some natural benches and soak in all the wonderful heat that comes from the hot springs. Kokanee Glacier is iconic here. And as I drive out from Nelson towards I live, where I live at what we call Six Mile, I look up to Kokanee Glacier all the time. And right now, every Saturday, I hear the helicopters going our over our house because they are taking people up there to spend a week cross country skiing. So it's a wonderful adventure, but you have to sign up really early to get a spot uh, up, up at the lodge at Kokanee Glacier. Kokanee, these are landlocked salmon. And uh, what happened was when the states put in uh, a dam, it, um, Stop the salmon being able to migrate from the Pacific all the way up to their natural spawning areas. So they became landlocked. And they have a four year life cycle up here. And you're seeing them in red, which is when they're going to go and uh, mate and dig their, their nests and uh, put the eggs and the sperm in, and then they die. But it, it's a wonderful treat to see them, Mother Nature at her best. Golf is a, a favorite spot here. Uh, we have over 25 championship golf courses in southeastern BC. And a lot of them have, um, where you tee off, there's magnificent views. They've been placed that way. So you get, get the view of the area and not just concentrate on your little balls and the holes that you want to get them in. Again, we have a circuitous route for skiing. It's called the Powder Highway. And we have skiers that come in from all over the world. This is our local ski hill, Whitewater. 
And uh, its claim is that it has the best powder skiing anywhere in North America. They're going to be expanding this. But what's the beauty of this uh, ski area is that they have not developed on the hill. So people stay down in Nelson. It's only about a half hour drive up. So the hotels here and restaurants of which we have lots uh, get to enjoy all these skiers that come in. Here's a picture of Baker Street in winter time. It's quite a charming community. I, I love this community and that's why I call this show Finding Awesome. We have many historic buildings because this was originally a center for mining. And um, there were mines right close. Plus when we talked about the, the silver mines that were up in another area, um, the people came here to do business during the heyday of the mines. And we're just as pretty in summer. If any of you have ever been in Victoria, I'm sure you remember the Parliament Buildings and the Empress Hotel. We have the benefit that our Nelson Courthouse was designed by the same architect as what made, uh, that created the, those two buildings in Victoria. The Rotary Club of Nelson is going to celebrate its 100th anniversary come July 1. And one of their main uh, projects has been Nelson's Rotary Lakeside Park. And uh, here you have this wonderful uh, natural sand beach. It's great for swimming, sailing, paddling, whatever. Oh, what happened to this that it turned sideways on me? <laughs> That's really funny. It wasn't sideways when I looked at it earlier today. Okay, the gremlins are at it again. Our, so I belong to the Nelson Daybreak and we were chartered in 1993. And one of our main projects has been to put in a world-class skate park. And I'm sure that the, the, some of the skaters see the world in that view. And white water rafting. I've only ever done this once and I was absolutely enchanted. We have some great rivers around here. Or again, you can do a whole circuit around the area and take whitewater um, rafting trips. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, this, this area has been logged and burned, I would say probably within the last decade. And what you're seeing is fireweed. And this is the first plant that um, grows and blooms after a fire. You see the forester looking at the trees. Um, our major industry in this area is um, logging. Here you see one of the logging trucks. And look at the width of the road. It's just amazing where they travel. Uh, and, and these fellows start off at three o'clock in the morning so that they can get two trips in a day. But um, you, ha you have to let them know that you're coming up the same road that they're coming down or you're in big trouble. <laughs> and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about old growth forests because here I, I do believe we have a picture of old growth forests. Down in the lower mainland uh, of British Columbia, an old growth forest is considered to have trees that are 250 years old. Up here in the interior of British Columbia, this is known as the interior wet belt, and our old growth forests have trees that are about 140 years old, and there's lots of them around. So there's, there's more and more of the uh, land where there's old growth forests that, um, where it's becoming protected. So this is the last view of Nelson on beautiful Kootenai Lake. And you're looking down to where we're gonna go next, which is trail. Now trail is a very industrial town. It's the home of the largest lead and zinc smelter in the world. And it has is the largest employer in trail. The smelter has been in operation for over a hundred years and has provided many well-paying jobs. And often um, the, the whole staff is intergenerational because you know, they, they know that they're going to have a good place to work for many, many years. 
This area is also known for its dams. Um, I wish I'd had the picture um, just on the right-hand side there around the horseshoe, because there is the Nelson Hydro powerhouse. And Nelson, Nelson Hydro was, was actually the earliest um, power development in the province. We have many dams. The whole Columbia River is dammed now. So we've been in Nelson, we've been down to trail, and we're going to head south across the U.S. border. This is our funny little border crossing. There's another one that's not too far away that deals with trucks, but this is my favorite one. Um, you don't have too many problems going back and forth. Actually, it's kind of funny. There was one of the, the border guards who said to me, Oh, Mrs. Hart, you haven't got any kids with you. And this was when I was ferrying Rotary Youth Exchange <laughs> students back and forth to various events. She remembered me for years. Again, the Columbia River that flows south of the border. And you have houseboats on the Columbia River in the summer. Down near Colville, there's the Confederated uh, Tribes. Uh, and the Colville Indian Reservation is significant. It was actually established 150 years ago in 1872 and it con consists of 2,825,000 acres or 4,410 square miles. And actually at one stage, the, the American government severed this reservation in half because they wanted to do something with half of the land. I love this picture. This is the camas flower and it blooms in the spring. And it was very important to the indigenous people because they would dig up the bulbs and it was a food source during the winter. Here you see a different kind of deer. And there's their black bear. I showed you a grizzly before, this is the black bear. So they, they, they don't pay much attention to the border crossings. They just come and go as they see fit. And moose, we have moose in this area. But south of the border, and I know I was shocked the first time that I drove down there because it's so different from up here. And what happened was that there was this huge uh, ice dam that was created uh, in the time of the glaciers. And as that melted, the waters behind it had melted and it scoured the land all the way down through the Columbia Valley. So a lot of it is flat and um, and it's great um, areas for cherry orchards. There you see the apple orchards that are on both sides of the river. The apple packing, probably Red Delicious, which they're famous for, because Washington State is the largest apple producer in America. And, and the Americans, uh, respect their land and have created many wildlife refuges. And these are used um, for recreation purposes and also for the wildlife in both summer and winter. Here you see the ski trails and uh, people also go with um, snowshoes. As we head further south, oh, there's snowmobiling, okay. As we head a bit further south, we get into Spokane. And often people who are even trying to come up to um, the West Kootenai area, they will fly into Spokane. And I've gone down to pick up a number of people because it's, it's a bigger hub and the airport is more reliable than in Kasagar that we have just north of the border. This is the wonderful river that flows through here. Beautiful suspension bridge over the river. And this is Riverfront Park. And what I find really interesting about this park is it's along the river, which used to be totally industrial. I think there were 13 different 
uh, rail companies that came in here. And finally, the city of Spokane decided that they wanted the center of their beautiful city um, as a retreat for the people. And they moved those industries out to other areas uh, in Spokane. So this is a hundred acre park and it is really magnificent at any time of the year. This, this is a sculpture called the artwork of runners. And uh, it has, it was uh, put together, I think, when in the eighties and it celebrates a major um, event that's held in Spokane every year called Bloom's Day. And this is the largest foot timed foot race uh, in the US. And it usually has over 50,000 participants a year if you can imagine. Spokane also has some wonderful facilities, the Spokane Arena. They have an opera house and they have a great convention center. And the opera house often has world-class uh, performances in it. And pre-COVID, I used to love to go down to some of the shows there. This is their Japanese Minito Park, which um, many, many people know about. And it's a celebration of um, a sister city arrangement um, with Nishin, I can't pronounce it, Nishinomiya, Japan. And when I first saw this, actually, I thought that it was had been built as a memorial to the Japanese who were so badly treated in the States and in Canada during the Second World War. There was so much fear that Japan was going to invade and that the people, even the people who had been born here were going to, to help the enemy. Um, and they were all put into concentration camps on both sides of the border. Um, and so there are places now that have developed parks, but this one is a, friend, uh, a sister relationship with the city in Japan. Lots of shopping in Spokane. Now we're going to go a bit further south to Lewiston. And again, I was so shocked the first time I drove down there. There are two cities, Moscow, Idaho, and a mere seven miles apart, uh, there's another city called Pullman, Washington. And both of these towns are known for their universities, uh, especially this, um, with Pullman, it's the School of Agriculture. And if you ever go there, you have to go to Fernando's. It's a creamery, they make cougar gold cheese. It's out of this world, as is the ice cream. So this area had its roots in agriculture. As you can see, they have a much flatter ground than what we have up here. Um, and uh, here you go, Moscow, Idaho in the early summer. And these are the lentils and peas. And they actually have a, um, a big um, lentil celebration every summer. It bore, uh, this area called the Palouse grows a quarter of the lentils in the United States. I would... Actually, it was kind of funny. I hadn't realized this. That I, we, I've been introduced to Appaloosa horses down there because uh, the, the main headquarters for the Appaloosa Horse Foundation is there. But the, the horses are named after the Palouse. Uh, Palouse. So there you go. <laughs> There's their headquarters. Typical farmhouse out in the country wheat fields in late summer. And th this is a gorgeous time to drive through that area of, of Washington State and Idaho. You can see the huge equipment that they use for harvesting. Now we're gonna get even further south. And I wanted to tell you about this area because I don't know how many of you were familiar with the Lewis and Clark expedition. It was called the Corps of Discovery. And um, it basically the American government wanted to find a way to get through the Western states and to the Pacific Ocean. And so Lewis and Clark and the, the 
folks that were with them, including some indigenous uh, members of that who really had the good contact in the language were able to find the route. This is a quite different area again. Clearwater River. And I have to show you this picture. This is the Lewiston, Idaho grade. And I was shocked the first time I went down it. Uh, it's an old spiral high, highway uh, that was constructed in 1917. And it has 64 hairpin curves on it. So you can imagine getting down from the highlands where all the agriculture is and you're going down to the, to the river. The other surprising thing about Lewiston are the grain elevators. And I scratched my head and I thought, how come they've got grain elevators in Lewiston? Well, since the dams have been put in on the Columbia River and the Snake River, it is possible for ocean going vessels to come all the way up to Lewiston. That's uh, 507 kilometers or 342 miles from Lewiston to the port of Seattle. And uh, actually I was in a conversation with a Rotarian down there last week on our district social. And he was saying that they really suffered a lot the last couple of years because of COVID, because the cruise boats, the small cruise boats that do that bring $5 million into that community every summer. And my last slide is the balancing rock with the balanced rock. And I think that this is appropriate because here we are, two states, two countries, or sorry, two states, one province, two countries, and it's always a balancing rock to keep everybody happy. So I will stop my screen share. And if you have any questions, please ask. Hi, Ian. Um, I, I sort of felt maybe I'm wrong, but you, you, you maybe missed something about Spokane. Some of the older people will remember there was a famous singer used to live there. He's got a house on the edge of the university campus. I'm really you not must be much older than me. White Christmas, I'm thinking. Oh, okay. oh, good for you. Have you been there? <laughs> Have you okay. been there? Did yes. he go you with you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That, yeah. I went there and that, that, that made my life. Going to Spokane oh, and Bing Crosby stuff. Gonzaga, yeah, Gonzaga. Gonzaga, good for you. Way to way to share that. Okay. Uh, Sheila, we have a question now. Uh, we have a, a rise of hand team, but before we have a, a question about, tell us about the COVID chat. COVID. He's from Brazil. There's Alonzo. He's been emailing. The COVID up here. Yep. In Canada. Well, we're still encouraged to wear masks, but uh, BC has taken off most of the restrictions now. So there are lots of people who don't wear masks. Um, we're just waiting for notification to be able to go in to get our fourth uh, booster shot. But it's not that way everywhere in Canada. And um, just in the last couple of, well, five weeks ago, my my sister-in-law had a stroke and was uh, in one of the, ho the hospitals in Orillia in Ontario. And initially they would allow one visitor in a day and then they closed it down completely. So, okay. yes, Tim. You have, you have some comments? Go for it, Tim. Um, unmute yourself, please. There we go. Uh, Sheila, I was wondering if um, Moscow, Idaho has any links with Russia, and if it does, how is it weathering the current storm? Oh, well, I haven't, I haven't discussed that with anybody. <laughs> um, let me see, I did have a little snippet here. Uh, it was named Moscow after the Civil War. And actually, yes, the first permanent settlers came to, no, just a minute, the first permanent settlers came to the Moscow area back in 1871. Um, I was not able to find uh, any specific link with Moscow 
Russia. Okay, it may well have been that there were, you know, but. What's the best season to visit uh, District Tibidiani? Uh, well, uh, summer, of course, and and um, I would say anywhere from mid June to the end of September. But uh, the winters are also nice, too, if you like to ski in a hot spring and what have you, snowshoe. We actually brought a Rotary Friendship Exchange team from Brazil in. We did it in late March. And we wrestled around and found nice warm coats for them to wear and hats and everything. And uh, they did everything, you know, we, we, we got on a sleigh ride. They went to the hot springs. They tried snowshoeing. So and cross country skiing. And so, you know, we're, we're open, we're open season at any time. Kimberly says she'll be booking in. <laughs> okay, yes, Susan. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering what the road from uh, Calgary was like to uh, Nelson. Is that a, a pretty road? Well, there's a couple of roads actually. And um, yes, I have to tell you one of the most, one of the nicest trips I ever made. I don't know whether some of you, I don't know if we've got anybody from the Eastern States or uh, if anybody who was involved with Rotoplast, but uh, Terry Hodgkins, who created um, a quilt project that really grew, Rap a Smile, it was called, and we became quite good friends. So anyway, we made arrangements that she would fly into Calgary, we'd go to the Calgary Stampede, and then we drove back down through here, and you go down the Rocky Mountain Trench, it's gorgeous, uh, over the mountain pass into Nelson, we showed her around Nelson, and then we drove her down to the Spokane area. And it, I mean, it, I was, it was like being a tourist in my own hometown. It, it was beautiful. So uh, what sort of temperatures are like in June? Because we will be in that area late June this year. Um, I would say mid twenties. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Mm. Celsius. And sometimes I think right now, and I hope we don't have a summer like we had last summer with a heat dome and we had more forest fires. It was terrible. It was just terrible. But yeah, it's come earlier in the season before any smoke hits. We'll so hope for the time, best. Sorry, what Pardon? time in summer was that? Was that late summer? Or? No, it hit early this year. It was just, there was this huge heat dome that settled over the province and uh, with um, lightning strikes and what have you, so. Okay. We'll go south. We'll go south. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course you got the Calgary convention coming up. What, and how many years? There's mm. Houston, Melbourne, Singapore, Calgary, four mm. years out. Mm. And I went, actually mm. the, Calgary Convention in 1993 was the first international convention that I went to. And some really elderly Rotarians said there will never be another Rotary Convention closer than Calgary. It was absolutely an amazing experience. Um, Calgary is known for the wonderful stampede that it has in early July. Well, they put on the whole stampede show for the Rotarians. They did the chuck wagon races and they had all sorts of other things and the big grandstand show. And uh, people were just enchanted. I mean, the ones from Singapore were a bit cold <laughs> because it was early July, but um, yeah. So think about coming to Calgary. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we are able to. Are there to any the other questions? Room. I don't see any other questions, Simi. So you can always email me if you do have questions, and I'll try and give you the information that you're looking for. So Sheila was so efficient; it's very difficult to have more doubts. <laughs> we have a hot mic, you know. Okay. Uh, I think I should come back. And yeah, I just had I had a a, a non presentation question but are, are they sending are we still doing the newsletter is the newsletter getting sent out i haven't been getting them 
Oh, you haven't? Yes, we've been doing it. Every couple of months we do the, the connections and in between we do a, just an update. Well, I haven't been getting anything and um, um, I tried to download it off the website and I was not successful. Really? Um, have you told Madhu about that? I sent Madhu a message and I never heard from her. Oh, really? Well, I'll send her a message and make sure that you get it. Hopefully everybody else is getting connections. I paid, I paid, I paid my dues. I may not be the administrator anymore, but I didn't think y'all kicked me out. I think it's I think it's also up on the website, but I haven't spent a great deal of time on the website. I, I tried to download it from there and and, and it was and I got nothing. Oh, okay. So the website wasn't working. Okay. Madhu is traveling at the moment, so she I is there for weeks ago when I sent her a message. I sent her a message weeks ago. Simi, I sent her a message weeks ago. Oh, weeks ago, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have some comments. Please give. Kimberly, I'll forward you the copies, okay? Okay, thank you. I appreciate it because I'd like to know what's going on. I do miss you all, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing we have this. I know, and I will be seeing you in Melbourne. I'm not going to Texas for right. political reasons. <laughs> Actually, um, you know, oh, I should mention this, that I offered to help Madhu to try and find volunteers for the ITHF booth in in um, in Texas, and um, I don't know. I sent an email out to everybody who has worked at the booth for the last four or five years. And I didn't get that either. Really? How oh dare? And I have. I think. I think I've been erased from the website because I quit as administrator. Oh, well, your name still shows up as the administrator. Oh, okay, Kimberly, may I suggest you put in your email right now on the chat? And okay. we will make sure that we have the correct email and we will discuss it. Now, um, sorry, Ian had his hand up before we go into the break room. Um, yes, uh, uh, no, Ian before, has a hand up. Yeah. Uh, before Ian has some comments or questions, please, Ian, go ahead. Yeah. Go, yep. go ahead, Ian. Okay, I just I was going to um, echo uh, Kimberly's. Uh, I've been worried about the newsletter too, and I've been dealing with Madhu about it. And the last uh, rash of messages she sent out, I have been following up all the New Zealand people. Uh, sadly, I have to report they're not obeying instructions and telling me, but the ones that have have not received these things. So there must still be some error. I've had exactly the same things over months, never received January never received um, the last one. And when she sent them all out, um, uh, sent three messages last week, uh, I got them all. And then she sent them to everybody. And the everybody that I've checked who have answered, uh, only one person has received one message. So I think there still is a problem. I'm going to do some final checking uh, tomorrow and then go back to her again. So it, it, there may be a fault there, I think. Okay. I'll, t I'll tell the, the webmaster too, okay, that there's issues. And uh, Susan and James said that they're also not getting the connections, so. No. Okay, but so I, I think this might be now uh, more than Madhu, but something with Vineet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need to talk to Vineet, yeah. But that's yeah, we good. Need to we need to tell her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so, so this is good because even though this is a virtual tour, mm -hmm. it also gives us an opportunity to deal with some of the ITHF issues that we may personally be encountering with the access to the website. So, we, you know, you're always welcome to make comments. Uh, what we want to is really maintain the connections with our membership. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to go into a break room. We're going to try to make sure the break room uh, has, we're only going to have three break rooms. That gives us an opportunity to really talk personally, but you can move from one room to the another one if you end up finding that you're by yourself because the computer sometimes does that. <laughs> so we have no control. This is a random thing created by the computer.